My name is Kelly. At the age of six, the Church of Scientology informed my parents I was a suppressive person. I needed to be handled or disconnected. The handling lasted 10 years. The disconnection came after that. Did the Church of Scientology make my parents do this? No. They had been members for almost 20 years. The doctrine taught them everything they knew. At 16 years old, I was out on my own. Out of sight, out of mind. This series will explore the iceberg that is Scientology. I was born into this organisation and my parents remained members until I was 14 years old. Scientologists believe that anyone who criticises the church is a suppressive person. May be tricked, sued or lied to or destroyed. In Scientology, a victim is one of the worst things you can be. No matter what a person does to you, you better refuse to be a victim. That makes you a better spiritual being. The consequences of speaking out could be devastating to you, your family and your eternity. By speaking out, I am aware that I am making myself an enemy. That the intention for making this video is to show how Scientology doctrine can manifest chaos within the family home. I was kicked out of home at age 16, and now 10 years later, me and my dad are beginning to communicate again. He has helped me answer some of the questions I've had about my childhood. I was born in Manchester, England to two young Scientologists working on staff. They had already spent years in the church learning the teachings from L. Ron Hubbard, the convicted founder of the religion and science fiction writer. My parents fully believed that they were helping to save the planet from the evils of man. They met on staff at our local org. My dad joined staff as a teenager after a friend told him Scientology could help him with his cycling injuries. My mother's father was also a Scientologist, so she was involved from a very young age. It's strange to be a child in Scientology because children don't really exist in Scientology. They are thought of as adults in small bodies. I believed I was an adult. My dad was working 90 hours a week for the org and he was paid pennies per hour. If you're wondering how they get away with that, they call all of their staff volunteers. His job was to recruit new members and to read knowledge reports. He had to seek out those who were saying negative things about the church, the suppressive people. When my first younger brother was born, my dad was not allowed any time off to see him in the hospital. My dad was told if he went to go and see him that he would be declared a suppressive person. He eventually decided to stop working for the org and became a public paying customer. We were not rich, but my parents would end up donating 250,000 pounds to Scientology. Long working hours and credit card debt would help them pay for their courses and mandatory donations to the IAS. Borrowing money is something the church actively encourages. We don't care. Got the simple. While we go online and look at all their credit cards so we can show it. So you can see that your people definitely have they will tell you to remortgage your house, take out a new credit card, or borrow from your friends and family to pay for your spiritual freedom. By the time I was age six, my parents were having some problems in Scientology. They weren't succeeding like they were promised, so they turned to the church for help. In this organization, if you are unhappy, they look for a person who is causing all of your problems. The problem is never Scientology, so, they do what's called a security check or a sec check on me, a six year old. A security check is where they put you on an e-meter, uh, which is essentially a lie detector and interrogate you to find out what your evil intentions are towards Scientology. They have a specific set of questions that are for children aged six to 12. You will hold two cans and a small electrical current passes through the cans into your body. 
You are asked 99 security questions and throughout the questioning, at some point the needle will move and they'll go, that, that, what did you just think of there? I don't remember what I said or did to make them feel the need to security check me, but the questions I was asked as a six year old include, what has somebody told you not to tell? Have you ever refused to obey an order from someone you should obey? Do you have a secret? Who have you made guilty? Have you ever done something you shouldn't when you were supposed to be in bed or asleep? Have you ever made your teachers or parents work harder than they should? Have you ever disappointed your parents? Have you ever pretended not to understand what you have done wrong? Little did I know this would be the first of many interrogations. Scientology came to a conclusion that I, as a six-year-old, was in fact a suppressive person. Examples of suppressive people include Adolf Hitler and Napoleon. They believed I had a master plan to try and destroy Scientology from the inside. For my parents, there were only two options at this point. My dad says, handling means you educate the troublemaker so they either become a Scientologist or they at least stop causing trouble. Educate has a very broad scope and involves coercion via rewards and punishments. If that fails, then all that is left is to disconnect. Now, I will admit, my very first word that ever came out of my mouth was no. That was never gonna bode well for me and the Church of Scientology. One of my earliest memories is receiving something very close to an exorcism. I was six years old. My parents wanted to get the evil out of me. Now, there is no holy water, but it is a grueling process of interrogation to ask the Thetans to leave the body. They are essentially thousands of dead alien spirits that are attached all over your body at birth. My parents thought that if they could get rid of my evil aliens, then a nice one could take its place. This process of interrogation and handling would be used throughout my childhood to keep me in check. In the meantime, I was put to work. Children are quite willing to work. A young child will haunt her mother trying to help out. Permit her to do so, and she'll get the idea that her presence and activity is desired. I would do chores after school, wash dishes, I would clean the windows and the mirrors with newspaper, and apparently that's a Scientology thing. I didn't know that. I thought that everybody cleaned their windows with newspaper. So that was a fun thing I learned when I got older. I would do hoovering, mopping the floor, raking the leaves, preparing food. Basically, if I was tall enough to do it, I did. The cleaning wasn't that bad, not compared to the e-meter. I was always afraid of the next time I would be put on the e-meter, so I thought that if I helped and showed that I was being good, then I might not be accused of being evil. I always knew when it was coming, if my parents argued, if something was going wrong, something wasn't quite right in their business or something, it would go like this. I would be accused of being an evil SP, and then I would be isolated. Usually that meant just being sent to my room, right? I was not allowed to eat with my family. I remember food sometimes being left outside my door as if I was a dangerous prisoner, <laughs> and nobody was allowed to acknowledge my existence. Even my siblings were told that they were forbidden to speak to me. I felt very lonely. I would then be told that I needed to write out a list of all of my crimes. At first, I was kind of unsure of what to write on this, but uh, I included any time I said something unkind to somebody, and even if I had a bad thought about somebody, I would write it down on this crimes list. This wasn't enough, ever. I remember occasions when my mother would drag me out of bed at 3 a.m and proceed to interrogate me on the e-meter until I confessed that my real intentions were to destroy my parents' marriage, destroy their business, destroy Scientology, 
and caused intentional harm to every member of my family. The interrogations lasted for hours and they wouldn't end until we reached this conclusion. Eventually, I learned what I was supposed to say. And worse, eventually, I believed I was bad. Crying or becoming upset about it angered her even more. She would say I was trying to make her wrong and trying to be a victim. After the interrogation, I would have to write a letter of apology to my parents, tell them how I wouldn't do it again and that I was sorry for my evil intentions. Being a victim is despised in Scientology because of something called the tone scale. The tone scale is sort of an emotional ranking of a person and it goes from minus 40 to 40. Now zero is death and 0 0.1 is victim. It is seen as a bad thing to even feel any negative emotions in Scientology because Scientologists believe that if bad things happen to you, it's because you have done something bad to deserve it. It all felt like emotional torture. I knew in my heart that I wasn't trying to hurt anybody. I tried to stop speaking. I thought that could help. It didn't. I used to sit in my room and pull huge chunks of my hair out. And I eventually had a little mohawk grow down where my parting was because I had pulled so much. I was trying to cope with the frustration I was feeling. I felt that I deserved to feel pain. I was always making amends for my evil intentions. My relationship with my mother is complicated. She accidentally got pregnant with me and had me at 17 years old. She did not really have a good relationship with her parents either, and I'm sure she had no idea how to raise me. Sometimes we got along and I was so relieved, relieved that things might be getting better. Sometimes she would wake me up in the middle of the night with an adventure. She felt lonely sometimes when she was drinking. Dad worked early in the morning, so would be in bed. So she would take me and my two siblings out to parks at four o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I was woken up for the interrogations and sometimes she wanted a fight. She didn't hurt me very often, but it was enough for me to be afraid of it. Physical and mental abuse is justified for a Scientologist because ultimately they believe if you get hurt or if you get sick, it's your own fault and hurting someone for a just cause is fine. Speaking of sickness, I never visited a doctor until I was kicked out of home. Scientologists believe that medicine and psychiatry are the evil of all evils. As children, if we got sick, we were told we pulled it in. Luckily, I never had any serious medical conditions as a child. I did have eczema on my arms from all of the cleaning products that I honestly just put up with. And I was taken to an optometrist, I can't say that, optometrist, there we go, <laughs> um, because I had a little squint in my eye and a wore eye patch. Occasionally we would receive something called a touch assist and it's basically where somebody will touch you with their finger and say feel my finger and you go okay and they do it all over your body, random places and then the place where it hurts until you go okay I feel fine. We also would do locationals where you'd walk around the room and name objects. Look at that tree. Okay. Very good. The aim of these exercises were to bring you into present time because if you're experiencing pain you're obviously reliving a past life or something. These assists do not relieve pain, they bore you <laughs> into going yeah I'm fine and then you shut up about it. A couple of years later, we moved to East Grinstead. For six months, the home of St. Hill, Scientology's UK base. My parents were taking more Scientology courses and I was enrolled at Greenfields, the UK's only Scientology school. It's located in the middle of the woods near St. Hill. It teaches Scientology to children of Scientologists. I went to five different primary schools, but I can tell you that none of those schools were like Greenfields. The only things I really remember from the school were running laps, cleaning board erasers, and an incident when me and three other students were made to go outside, kneel on the ground, 
and there was like rocks on the ground so we were wearing those like little summer dresses and we would kneel on the ground and the rocks would get like indented into our knees and we had to move all these little stones to another pile somewhere else. I remember complaining that my knees hurt and they said if you can do it faster then you won't have to kneel anymore. So we used our dresses like a basket, put the, loaded all the stones into our laps, carried them off and moved them to the pile. I am pretty sure that I told the teachers there that I didn't believe in Scientology in front of a whole class of people. To me, L. Ron Hubbard was just the old man on the boring tapes that I used to have to listen to in the car. I didn't know we were meant to clap for him at the end of a lesson, and I'm pretty sure I refused to do it, saying, well, I'm not a Scientologist. This would have been enough to get me in serious trouble. All of the staff were Scientologists, and it's likely this would have been seen as our ethics. I don't remember a lot of the lessons or anything that we particularly learnt. I did look at the reports for the school and Ofsted show that the students there underperform in their core subjects. And I know they actually use the school to recruit children into the Sea Org. Some of these children that go to this school go straight into the Sea Org before they've even graduated. And we will talk about that a little bit later on in the iceberg, but it's essentially Scientology's labor workforce. They deliver Scientology. I remember we did loads of word clearing. Word clearing is where you have to look up words you maybe didn't understand in a dictionary. If you yawned, it meant that you misunderstood a word. Everybody used to hide their yawns. And if you got caught, you'd have a dictionary plonked down in front of you and you'd have to go through all of the words that you had looked at that day to find out which one you didn't understand. I also spent time at FLAG, which is the FLAG land base in Clearwater, Florida. My dad actually achieved level OT5, which is pretty advanced. So we were at FLAG a few times. My parents were having up to 12 hours of auditing a day and studying. There was a time when my grandma came along to look after us. The people at FLAG tried to enroll her on a course and she promptly told them where to shove it. And she fondly recounts that story to me often. I also made some friends at FLAG. There were other Scientology children there too. And I remember one of them actually lived there. We stayed in the hotel, swam in the pool. And to be honest, I mostly thought it was a holiday at the time. No parents, food was good, swimming pool. Then when we got brave, we would go and try explore as much of the building as we could. I did sneak into the crystal ballroom once just to have a look around. I was only enrolled on one Scientology course. It was called Overcoming Ups and Downs. I was eight years old. The registrar informed me that it was not normal to be too happy or too sad. That's how he did it with the arms. <laughs> And he said, you need to be like this. This will help you become neutral. I, I'm not gonna lie to you, I was shitting myself. I did not wanna do this course and I'd been told never to lie. And I knew they wanted me to do it. So I sat up in my chair and I was like, look, I don't really think this is for me. I don't really believe in this. It's a lot of money. I don't really wanna do the course. Now my parents are sat either side of me, dead silent, nothing. The reg convinced my parents to buy the course and they hand over 600 pounds so I can do this overcoming ups and downs course and my two younger siblings can do learning how to learn. We are then marched down to a library and told to start. Look, I enjoyed reading as a child. I used to spend my break times at school in the library Harry Potter, loved it. Series Unfortunate Events, yes. Jacqueline Wilson, I have read them all. But as a child, the Scientology books were boring and I just wasn't interested. So there's a member of staff patrolling the room and I look at my brothers and I tell them, open the book, they open the book. And we each take a small little stone that's in the middle of the table. Don't know why they were there, but they were. And I tell them to move the stone along the sentence as if they were reading it. I knew we were being watched. As soon as the staff member was out of sight, 
I told them that we were leaving and we ran out of there as fast as we could out of the big steps of St. Hill, across the other side to where LRH's house is. We ran through all of the trees and stuff and stayed out there for hours. We actually had a great day. We laughed about how silly it all was. That was the last time we ever visited an org. When we moved back to Manchester, things were about to get a little worse. My mum decided that she was going to homeschool us, teaching us Scientology, of course. We took part in a home sauna program that my mum thought would be good for us as she had just completed the purification rundown. This is where you spend five hours a day in a sauna and take high doses of niacin. You'll also have to drink this really gross drink called CalMag, which is like calcium, magnesium and water and it's minging. Now, I don't think we had to do the full five hours in the sauna, but I do remember going in the sauna, I remember taking the niacin, I remember my skin would get really red and itchy because high doses of niacin can cause that. But apparently that was a good thing because it meant you were detoxifying. Eight and nine year olds have got a lot to detox, obviously. We also did training routines. I was told that these training routines would help me confront bullies. Instead, I was sat on a chair opposite my mum and the first routine we did was just staring. Just staring. have to complete two hours of staring. No blinking, no flinching, no looking away, or else you flunk and you have to start again until you can do it for two hours. Once I did that, I had to learn to take verbal abuse. They call it bull baiting. So again, we're sat on the chairs. My mum would be opposite me and would have to try and find my buttons. So things that would bother me. And she would say some pretty mean things, to be honest and all I had to do is not react. I was then asked to do these routines on my younger brothers. I refused. I will explain the training routines when we dive into the iceberg fully, but they basically induce a trance state and indoctrinate a person to better communicate with other Scientologists. And this is the reason for that intense glare that you see them have in like protest videos. Exactly what Scientology does. What have you done? What are my crimes, you mean? Yeah, just what have you done? You can actually get your ethics to Marty. That would be the thing. Stop committing suppressive acts. Full time suppressive acts. Full time. Well, probably a little ignorant, I would imagine. No, that's that's certainly maybe don't. You need to just tell them your crimes. Tell them your Mark. crimes, Bunker. What are they from? From the time you were a kid. How many things did you steal? Now, huh? Told me How, many did you How many did you steal? How many things have you stolen, Mark? Mark, Mark, are you gay? You pervert. Are you gay? What's are the really, deal with I mean, you? Are you a pervert or are you gay? I'd like to I know. Passed out Mary. My friends always ask me. Well, how come you didn't believe in Scientology? It must sound quite weird for a child to oppose the family's religion. But the simple answer is, I was being told that I was thinking these evil intentions and I knew I wasn't thinking them. Like if someone says you said something when you know you didn't. Every time I confessed to something, it was news to me. I didn't even understand the concept of business and marriage, let alone have a plot to destroy it. Another reason is, is that I went to five different primary schools. I quickly saw that none of my friends had this kind of life. I learned that my friends had different religions and theirs sounded more fun than mine. They had gods and celebrations and we had this guy and a lie detector. 
They were allowed sleepovers to visit each other's houses. They certainly did not have lie detectors. My parents hated all of my non-Scientology friends. Um, they said they were bad influences on me. They made me look ugly. They made me all these things that they were influencing me to be like, which is just not true. I had great friends, but all throughout my childhood, I never really told anyone what was happening at home. I knew it was a bit weird. I didn't really know how to tell anybody. And I also was so scared of what would happen if my mum found out that I said something. So I just didn't say anything. The more time that I spent with non-Scientologists, the more I realized that something was wrong. Things were not all bad. We had Christmas, we did family holidays. And sometimes it seemed like I had like finally done enough to show that I was could be a part of the family again, that I was finally good enough to have a normal life because at this point I believe the only reason I wasn't having a normal life was because I was really bad. We moved house one last time as a family. I was 11. We lived in a beautiful house, five bedrooms, four bathrooms, a swimming pool. The only thing I didn't like about it was that it took longer to clean. <laughs> I started going to a school I really loved and I started to join every extracurricular thing I could find. I wanted to stay in school as late as I possibly could. And music was the best. I did all of the music things. I joined a samba band, a wind band, choir, jazz orchestra, shows. My school even had free music lessons, so I took up trumpet and piano and singing. I finally felt like I belonged to a group and I was always encouraged and I'll always be grateful for that experience that I had. However, in my normal life, I became very depressed. I was doing pretty well with my grades. I was asked to complete extra GCSEs. Wish I knew that nobody checks your GCSEs. Wish I knew, but I do now. I even got a early morning paper round at the weekend. It took me like four hours. I would do it on foot and I would get paid a fiver. Can you believe that? A fiver. But I wanted my own money so desperately. Whenever I needed new clothes or new uniform because they had holes in, I was always reminded of what an expense I was. And I really wanted to unburden my parents from my needs as a dependent child. I was working really hard and I was trying to uh, you know, do well and, and overachieve to please them. And I was just kind of made to feel like an inconvenience. And it was always under threat. The things I loved could always be taken away from me. They did not like showing up to school for parents evenings or things like that. I would usually just go by myself. My mother and I would start arguing more and more. She tried to stop all my activities and I disobeyed. I would spend like weeks rehearsing for a concert and then on the day she'd be like, nah, you can't go. And I went anyway. Friends would come and pick me up to take me there because I wasn't gonna let anybody down. Um, this would make our relationship completely unstable because now I was a disobedient teenager, breaking the rules, going to concerts, being a badass. And let's just bear in mind here, by the way, guys, I never got into any fights. I wasn't drinking. I didn't do drugs. And I didn't have a boyfriend. All I was doing was just stuff related to my school. That was it. The very last time I saw a Scientologist, they were OTAs and they came to our house. My mum was having some problems with some past traumatic childhood memories that she wanted help with. She asked some people from the church to come down. They did not help her. Um, they just tried to get her to do more auditing, basically. But they did take me off to the side. And I'm 12 years old at this point, by the way. And they take me off to the side and they ask me to join the Sea Org. They actually presented me with a billion year contract, like, so I know it's real. I've seen it with my own eyes. So they presented me with this billion year contract and told me that I would be going out to sea. Now, I told them that I was gonna be a famous singer, so I didn't wanna join the Sea Org. And then they quickly changed their story and was like, yeah, well, you'll do festivals and you'll meet all the celebrities. And I was like, mm, this seems a bit too good to be true. 
And I, again, said no. And I'm very glad that I did. And they're also supposed to ask for parental consent. And when I told my dad about this, he had no idea that they had even asked me to join the Sea Org. Like, it was very sneaky. Eventually, my dad started to think about leaving Scientology. He finally looked at the forbidden content on the internet. In Scientology, you're not allowed to look at any negative press about Scientology. But they are told everything from it will disrupt your progress to you could get pneumonia and die. But they looked and then they decided to leave. They received some harassment from the church and were consumed by the internet and the fact that they had been hoodwinked. I think at that time, they couldn't believe they had been wrong about me as well. Because if they had admitted that they were wrong about me, then they would have to admit that all of the treatment and emotional abuse that I received was wrong for being an SP. By age 14, I had developed an eating disorder. I was trying to cope with this secret life that I had at home. I needed help, but I didn't dare ask anybody. I didn't know how to ask. I was afraid that social care could split up me and my brothers, and I was taught to be afraid of doctors and psychiatrists. I didn't really know what to do. My school raised their concern for my well-being, so I got a referral and I was sent to CAMS, which is a child adolescent mental health service. Uh, for therapy, every week after my sessions, I would be interrogated by my parents. They would ask me, what did you say about us? What did you tell your counselor about us? And I honestly didn't say anything about them for such a long time because I was so scared to. It was like, if they find out I've told somebody then I'm gonna be in big trouble. So I didn't for a long time. My school phoned my parents about my eating disorder, uh, really made them angry and they were really angry with me. And our relationship just completely broke down. Now, nobody was talking to me except to yell at me or to fight me. I turned 16 in November 2010, and two months later I would be told I had to leave. I wasn't completely homeless. My dad found a bedsit for me to stay at that he would pay for for a little bit. But of all of it, the hardest thing was, was that my two younger brothers were forbidden from talking to me. They were attending the same school as me and they weren't allowed to speak to me. I later found out that my mum had told my brothers that she was going to kill herself if I stayed in the house any longer and that she just didn't want them talking to me anymore. Um, and that was the most horrible thing. That was the hardest thing to hear because I love my brothers. I love them a lot. I was so lucky in that I had so much support from some really special people at my school. I had someone who attended solicitors meetings with me. I had to get legal estrangement from my parents and hand over guardianship to some adult because I still needed someone to give me permission to do things. I had people come and check on me in this bedsit. They would help me with groceries. I couldn't believe that all of these people had stepped up to help me. But they never gave up on me and they never let me give up on myself either. I'm thankful for the heroes that stepped into my life as the adults at the time when I needed it the most. And I know some of you might be watching, so thank you and I love you. <laughs> Thankfully now, me and my brothers are back in contact and I'm so proud of them and their strength to deal with all of what happened after I left because the blame got shifted onto them and the thing I regret the most is not being there to protect them. My parents split up and my dad has been taking steps to rebuild a relationship. We are now starting to write to each other. He has helped me put some of the pieces back together about my past and about my childhood. It's a long road and one that takes courage from both sides. My mother has not been in contact. As she said on the day that I left, out of sight, out of mind. I am, I don't feel any malice towards my parents. I've come to understand they were indoctrinated into a belief system since they were teenagers. Is this a good excuse? No. And I'll be honest, it's a very slow road to recovery. But that is where Scientology ends in my life. More recently, after being in contact with my dad, I wanted to learn more about the religion I grew up in. Naturally, 
I had many questions. <laughs> I have spent months researching, so I hope that you'll join me in part two where I'll give a breakdown of everything I've learned about the Church of Scientology and how deep this iceberg goes. If you have made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I just think it's important to share these experiences because if we don't say anything, then nothing can change. If you have been affected by Scientology and you're looking for support, I will leave some links down in the description below. Other than that, I will see you in part two where we will start with the tip of the iceberg and delve into the iceberg of Scientology. Bye, thank you so much. Thank you.